there, there is a certain overlap uh, between the, this session and the last session. <laughs> it seems it's quite interesting this, this, how, how authoritarian regimes are using Western regulation as a pretext or an excuse. What, what could be done to avoid this? It seems like a quite difficult paradox. Um, we've been discussing in, at different levels on this. Um, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, for instance, are, as I stated, they, they claim that they address authoritarian regimes without naming them, and they are trying to treat different regimes uh, according to the same rules. So when you do it, then those regimes want to be treated equally. So my uh, domestic remedies should be exhausted as yours. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the argument Russians, uh, Turks, and other um, Azeris uh, raised before uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Even yesterday, uh, the Turkish Minister of Justice stated that no one can order Turkish judges. That's why I will not comment on the conviction of Istanbul mayor. Everybody knows that. Judiciary is the main problem. So if something to be corrected, it is the system itself, judiciary itself. Without addressing the problems in judiciary, there is no way to solve the problems relating to freedom of expression. So uh, what can we do? We can be honest to see that those domestic remedies are not effective. If international human rights really want to work, as uh, this morning stated, uh, you cannot treat basketball as ice hockey. Mm. Uh, you have to play according to the rules. And if the uh, rulers are violating them, then you have to make distinction between um, regimes playing according to the rules and others uh, acting against uh, those rules. Uh, that, that's why I think the main problem is about the judiciary and the quality of uh, rule of law, even before freedom of expression. Yes. I think uh, there are several ways to look into it. and. Um, one, uh, I mean, I wear another hat where, you know, I work um, um, at Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, and what I'm seeing is that um, civic spaces are shrinking rapidly, uh, and the voices who, uh, who are very vital and crucial to criticize uh, uh, powerful actors, be it governments or tech giants, these voices are being silenced. And I think it's very important to see what Western democracies actually can do so that these voices can still survive in their own jurisdictions and in their own countries. And it, still be critical to the you know powerful regimes that they are being uh, uh, you know critical to if these voices are, won't be there i don't think that uh, you know like then only the powerful actors will be there and that right. yeah it's interesting because pakistan i mean it, it happen, it's using the same same uh, excuses like you know clamping down on extremism and uh, and uh, false information and so on uh, in order to shrink these uh, pub public spaces, especially on, on, uh, on, on social media and tech platforms. Can I just ask you how, how I mean, could, could, could the private uh, rules of engagement in terms of service in the big tech companies and social media platforms be strengthened in order to, to, to uh, protect users in Turkey or Pakistan or Russia, for instance, uh, or anywhere else? Yeah, so when you were talking about the regulation, I was like, okay, it feels like the, 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 the rules around uh, uh, removal of harmful content in Pakistan that is being uh, now applied and being also challenged in the court 
actually are the same. Mm. I was like, are they copy pasting each other? Uh, but um, yeah, so I mean, we are seeing the same trends around regulatory framework, uh, criminalizing uh, speech uh, online and in the name of regulating tech platforms in our own countries are actually trying to control users and uh, trying to fetch their data from these tech companies by pushing them to register in our countries where there is actually no safety for the companies, but at the same time, no really data protection regulatory framework for the users. Um, and I think for some of us, it's like relying on these, as I said earlier, that uh, these social media platforms might be a form of entertainment in some jurisdictions, but for some it's a lifeline. And that's why it's so important for me personally, not being part of Oversight Board, but me personally living in Pakistan, seeing how you know you, it's, it's much needed for users, especially the marginalized ones, especially the vulnerable ones who usually don't find space and voice in the offline space. That's the only lifeline for them. Um, so we tend to rely on platforms because we know that the regulatory frameworks are so draconian that you know we who is the more i would say you know uh, who is the less evil you know for us so so relying on them but i think at the same time uh, sitting in the oversight board i i noticed one thing that all this diversity in the board is actually uh, bringing knowledge from the difficult context and helping us to take decisions that usually company, big tech giants cannot really see, right. even though they have uh, a lot of resources. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, uh, in, in one of the cases that you mentioned, the UK drill case, uh, we have just released uh, a decision. We actually asked company, you know, their relationship with the law enforcement. The UK is a democracy, established democracy, but how the relationship sort of work between the tech giant and the law enforcement and the government is a huge question, and we ask this difficult question to, to Meta, basically. Right. No, by the way of <clears throat> what you were saying, that uh, authoritarian regimes uh, using, uh, let's say, democratic liberal examples. Uh, there's a study that Jacob knows well uh, about the influence of the, of the NETS DG, the German NETS DG in authoritarian regimes. Huh? And it seems that, let's say, the, the German NETS DG law, which was seen as reasonably good within the European context and the system of checks and balances in, in Germany, if taken to Vietnam or uh, authoritarian regimes where, I mean, this check, system of checks and balances doesn't exist, of course, the outcome is completely different. And I can tell you that um, uh, during that period of time, every time I was, I was having discussions with governments of countries that were not 100% democ democratic, I mean, the first question was, tell us about that NETS DG <laughs> law in Germany. Uh, this is what they wanted to know about. So, I mean, uh, and the question here is that, I mean, we need to admit that uh, in the North or the West, sometimes we make bad, bad laws. Mm. And the risk of making bad laws, it's not only that, I mean, these laws may affect the rights of th citizens in this part of the world, but it's also that they may be copied, used in other parts of the world so, to make so, things even worse. So a private oversight body is preferred to you. You would prefer a private oversight body in Meta or any other social platform than a government interference. And it depends. I think that there are things that I mean, governments and judges need need to do, and there are other things that I mean need to be left to self-regulation. And this is not new. At the end of the day, no. Here, I mean, the, the, this is a different type of self-regulation. But at the end of the day, it's it's the it's self-regulation. No? I mean, what is also interesting about the oversight board, um, it's that, I mean, the Oversight Board applies human rights to the internal rules mm. of META. Yeah. So, because when there's a, a, a legal request coming from a state authority, the Oversight Board cannot intervene. Huh? So it's not, it does not analyze legality, huh? but it uses human rights law to assess community standards. Right. Another interesting example, I believe, it's the right to be forgotten. I mean, the famous right to be forgotten in Europe, that then, of course, in countries like Turkey, Russia, I mean, the way this has been, and say, no, it's, 
I mean, this is an European thing. We, we use it, huh? but uh, of course, the, uh, the the way it has been <coughs> and uh, it has been incorporated into these legal systems is, is horrible. I don't think it's a thing of ignorance. Right. Huh? I mean, because some people say oh, perhaps we need to explain to them. Uh, I mean, we need to go and explain this is how it works, etc. No, I don't think it is. It is a mistake. It's just let's say taking the idea tweaking it and uh, adapting it to the, yeah. to the local needs to do something that is terrible. Uh, as a journalist, to be forgotten is not a right but a horrible threat, of course. Uh, Ask, can I? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, so so <coughs> um, shamelessly using my status as an organizer to come with a comment more than a question, but you, you can also comment on it. I think, there, there are actually some, some, some good practices where, where democracies have led. So I mentioned briefly the, the Helsinki process, so, so the adoption of the Helsinki Final Act, which basically saw Western states uh, make agreements with the communist states that included human rights language, including important language about uh, strengthening freedom of ex uh, expression, independent media, and so on. I think the Soviet bloc basically saw it as empty promises. You know, okay, we'll sign on to this if you respect our borders, nothing will happen, it's, we're just paying lip, lip service. But it also meant that Western democracies bet that human rights was a, uh, and free speech especially was a, was a competitive advantage for democracies in the fight against authoritarian states. Um, and basically saying, okay, so we'll use these human rights standards to empower dissidents behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, um, we'll set up human rights organizations that can, that can get information from, from dissidents, uh, amplify it. But at the same time, we agree not to crack down on Soviet disinformation uh, within uh, uh, Western states. We uh, allow not to ban uh, socialist parties, even though their political programs run against uh, the, the basis uh, of, of, of our governance. And I think that turned out pretty well. Another good example from the international arena is uh, the whole fight over defamation of religion. So this was basically a campaign by uh, the, the Organization of, of Islamic Cooperation to uh, say that blasphemy should be uh, uh, sh blasphemy should be banned under human rights, and this campaign succeeded for a while until the State Department uh, made a, a conscious campaign to rally a lot of countries around and saying no, actually blasphemy uh, is protected by freedom of expression. You have the right to criticize and mock religion. And suddenly a number of African countries and other joined this again, uh, 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 agenda. And, and this actually helped establish much stronger standards for the protection of free speech at the international level. But these are sort of clear examples of democracies leading the way on strengthening free speech standards, putting their money where their mouth is, but at the same time also acknowledging that this means that people can say things that you don't like, but that's basically what you have to suffer. I mean, that's the real meaning of tolerance. Tolerance means that you have to accept uh, ideas that you don't like, and that's baked into the, to the principle of free speech. I don't really think there's a way for democracies to, to have it both ways. Democracies can't say on the one hand, oh, we're gonna ban the stuff that we don't like, um, while at the same time uh, lampooning authoritarian states uh, for when they go further th than that. So, so I think we need to get back to that spirit uh, and, ha and, and acknowledge free speech as a competitive advantage for democracies when they're fighting authoritarian states. Just, just a brief, very, very brief remark to, I mean, follow, follow on what has just been said. Uh, something that was overflying the, the debate this morning, but I always like to mention in this kind of, of, of uh, I meant to say, gatherings, which is to say that freedom of expression is about overview, uh, um, um, viewpoint absolutism, I agree. I think that another good definition here that I uh, would like to put on the table is that there's free speech where you don't have the right not to be offended. Hmm? where you don't have the right not to be offended. So if you have the right not to be offended, then there's no free speech. If someone can be offended and this offense is prosecuted by the law, then you don't have for, uh, free speech. The real test for free speech is that nobody has the right not to be offended, which is different from the right not to be harmed 
Uh, I think that there's the, sometimes it's difficult to draw the line, of course, but, but and this also has to do with blasphemy mm -hmm. And, uh, and the difference between, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the, this, this, um, the, 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 the end of the project of the formation of religion opened the door to the Re Rabat plan of action. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the, I mean, going, for, uh, right. for going further uh, when it comes to hate speech. Yeah. No? And I think that this is where you draw the line. Uh? Fleming, Fleming Rose earlier uh, pointed at that, this, that, the, that the speed or the, the, the space between harm and uh, between uh, offense, uh, being offended and being harmed is smaller. It's getting more and more narrow. It's very relevant different. because this is where yes. we draw the line. Yeah. Uh, between, and perhaps something that is harmful is not harmful here mm -hmm. yeah. in Denmark. Yes. Uh, the same thing if it's said in Pakistan. Yeah. It is harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps in Pakistan it is hate speech. Uh, and we right. cannot say it. Uh. Yeah. But... Uh, okay. Good. All right. Questions or, or comments? I mean, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, hi. In relation to what you said uh, at the in the oversight board, I would like to ask: What do you think uh, social? Which role do you think social media plays um, in reacting to crises such as the one you just mentioned in Afghanistan, and to uh, prevent disinformation to spreading uh, in such events? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, when um, um, the Afghanistan conflict started, uh, what we not noticed um, um, as a board, but also living right next to Afghanistan, uh, that these tech giants were not actually ready to deal uh, with the um, unexpected uh, um, sort of things that <laughs> happened there around um, online spaces, but also they were not really ready to deal with that. Um, so uh, so I'm, while responding to this, I'm actually wearing two hats. One is you know, running the cyber harassment helpline in Pakistan where we started getting lots of uh, calls from the journalists uh, who were really worried about their uh, devices, but their online information that was available and being tracked by uh, by Taliban. And, uh, and while sitting on board, what we were seeing that lots of uh, media organizations and journalists who were actually reporting about the conflict and mentioning Taliban, their content uh, was taken down. They started being taken down by the platforms, different platforms, but we were seeing what, what, what was happening on Meta. Um, why? Because Taliban uh, was added as, uh, and I believe still added as uh, 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 the dangerous uh, uh, organization list in the, uh, in the Meta's policies. Um, and uh, but we then got a case uh, and decided on that case and told Meta that the decisions that you have been taking uh, while taken down this content, uh, uh, and I believe it was Al Jazeera case, I exactly don't remember, but it was related to Afghanistan conflicts where journalists were reporting and their content was being taken down. And we told company very clearly, uh, uh, first of all, we uh, sort of overturned that decision uh, and asked them to put the content back on the internet because it was journalists reporting the conflict from Afghanistan or uh, about Afghanistan, mentioning Taliban, and we said that it's a newsworthy content. So you really need to protect what, what journalists are saying, what media organizations are saying in conflict zones, and while still governments and tech journalists Giants are struggling whether the Taliban are a de facto government or still dangerous organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can Anyone I else? editing yeah, yeah, about this Helsinki spirit and how difficult to catch it now? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right to be forgotten is a very good example. Uh, when you need, you adapt this concept to your domestic law. And you said, okay, now we have a right to be forgotten. So uh, a thing happened three years ago about a politician should be forgotten now, delete everything. Then, for instance, you, uh, as an outsider, say, that, oh, this is not right to be forgotten. You are mistaken. And suddenly, the local authority says that we, we don't have anything to learn from you. 
we, we, our, our judges, our law is independent. When you need it, you, you adapt it. But when it is criticized, when the implementation is criticized, then we, we don't have anything to learn. Because th there's a rise of nationalism and conservatism everywhere. And this is uh, presented as, uh, as uh, anti-imperialism. So uh, teaching some legal concepts to uh, those authorities are perceived as, uh, um, as a tool of imperialism and abused by them. So that is very old. You transfer when you need it, but when you are criticized for misimplementing it, then you say that, no, 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 we, we don't have anything to learn from you. Uh, so that's why uh, nowadays it's quite difficult to catch this Helsinki spirit, I'm afraid. <coughs> OK, I'll just ask you. Um, the uh, Facebook meta was, like most other social platforms, for quite some time resisting the calls for self-regulation. We are only a platform, we are infrastructure, we can't do this, we are not media. Now, now there is uh, the oversight body and it seems that meta has really, really taken it on. It's, it's, being, uh, it, it's, it's having a more and more important function in, in the organization. So it seems that Meta is now somewhere between, because of the self-regulation, somewhere between infrastructure and media, uh, making it probably stronger. Uh, you raised the, 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 uh, you were the, the awareness that it might also be a problem that is creating a much stronger monopoly. I mean, it's impossible to get into the fight with a company like, a company like Meta when you also have to have a self-regulating body like this. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that there has been an evolution, an important evolution in this field. <clears throat> I think that tech companies in the early 2000s, um, they were very much, uh, they had this very much liberal approach to free speech. Yeah. First Amendment, California, I mean, this kind of, let's say, here we allow anyone to say whatever they want, and the limit is very, very but far away. Yeah, they, they were just infrastructure, so they were. They were just they infrastructure, and yeah. I mean, they were not even, in terms of, let's say, internal rules. They they thought that they, they there was no need for internal rules to govern speech mm -hmm. because it was just this idea of the marketplace of ideas, etc., which is something that probably makes sense within the context of Silicon Valley, California and a certain vision of the world, let's say, no, of the hippie, if you wish, uh, vision. But these companies became global. Hmm? Uh, these companies started to host many different types of content, perhaps content that the way they, they were not expecting. For example, I mean, this, this uh, morning you mentioned John Perry Barlow. I think that the idea that he had of the internet was some sort of a space where the elite was going to discuss uh, about novel things. Uh, probably he didn't envisage the internet of a place where, I mean, crazy people would be saying crazy things. I think that that was a vision a little bit elitist in the sense of, this is a space where everybody will be equal and will learn from each other because etc cetera, etc cetera, no? but then things change and i think that companies uh, started to to realize that they needed some internal rules and if you see the evolution in terms of numbers uh, in terms of the the content moderation team that Facebook had in 2005 or 2006, and today, I mean, it's incredible. They had just a bunch of people with a little booklet, I mean, trying to figure out, and now, I mean, it has become something extremely, extremely sophisticated. I, I, and also, I think that companies change the behavior. I mean, in the, uh, let's say, 10, 10 years ago, when people in Brussels were telling them, we'll regulate you, huh? the reaction was, well, we are an American company. Mm -hmm. You cannot regulate us. Forget yeah. about that. No? And now this has changed. Huh? Now, I mean, the, the tendency is to say, no, we will incorporate more internal rules, and we accept the legitimacy of institutions like the European Union to regulate us. And even in the case of Meta, they say, and we like it. Because Meta, I mean, the Mark Zuckerberg um, um, also always says, no, no, we are for regulation. We understand that, that we need to regu be regulated. Right. No? Um, 
so there has been an evolution. A revolution based, of course, on corporate interests, uh, because I mean, of course, at some point it was understood that this, I mean, idea of saying we are not regulated and you can say whatever you want, it was not good for them. Um, and now they have realized, for economic, for reputation reasons, etc., that they right. need to embrace regulation, right. and they need to embrace self-regulation. And this is why, for example, the Oversight Board was created. So it's an interesting revolution that has taken years, but uh, I think it is, it is worth analyzing it in detail, because you see that they have many things have changed right. in the way. Yeah. 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 And, and of course, you know, self-regulation is uh, one innovative solution towards several, you know, uh, and that's why there is um, uh, there is always that, you, you know, like a sort of positivity that, yes, regulatory frameworks from uh, Western democracies are fine, but at the same time, I think it's also, it, it, it sort of uh, brings another risk that I'm, you know, sort of thinking by, you know, like about, about Turkey, about Pakistan, about jurisdictions where we also have regulatory frameworks. So when our governments say that you are following the framework from EU and other jurisdictions, then why you are not listening to us? And that makes a very, you know, that, that put companies in, into a difficult situation. And that's where my worry is that they, in, in here, you, when they talk to the government, at least, you know, there is some, some sort of transparency towards users. So public, public can question the government or, uh, and question the company. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know. I feel that there is more transparency here than in than our part of the world. But when it happens in our part of the world, uh, when companies speak to the regulators and governments behind doors, there is no transparency. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what are the negotiations happening behind doors. And uh, the, the, the rules that you, uh, the regulation that you were talking, same kind of rules we have in Pakistan. In recent development, just last, week, we learned that under the same rules that are still challenged in the court, and the court said that re these rules should go back to the parliament and parliamentarians should discuss because these violate fundamental freedoms, the regulator are still implementing the rules despite the order from the court, and Google registered its local office in Pakistan. And they are not transparent about it. We just found out through media. So that's the, the, the lack of, and I think Monica mentioned this in the morning, and she actually uh, pressed that transparency should be the key for the companies and the governments. Um, but the, the lack of transparency in uh, some jurisdictions actually uh, are a big, big, massive issue when the draconian regulations are there and the, when companies and governments are talking to each other and users don't know what they are talking about. Right. Okay. Maybe in the end here we should talk a bit about Twitter as an example of everything we're talking about here. What, what's going on uh, in Twitter? Of course, Elon, our friend, uh, is, is uh, claiming that this is... Uh, well, he's, he's, he's really referring to the, what you're talking about was the actual argument a few years ago from most, most companies that we have a unlimited uh, First Amendment uh, freedom of speech. Uh, this is what we're doing. Everybody should be here. Uh, we're just a platform. Uh, what do you think is, is going on and how has the way things have changed made that different? I, I would just say <laughs> a smaller thing and then you can elaborate. Uh, I think Elon made Meta look better. <laughs> that, that, that would be my small comment. Yeah. <laughs> No, and I think that uh, also Elon Musk gave value to the work that had been previously being done at Twitter. Hmm? I mean, people realized uh, that the Twitter safe and, safe and um, trust and safety teams that were in place, they were doing a great job, and they were doing a complicated job, and that uh, moderating content is not that easy. So this is what, I mean, the, uh, Elon Musk has shown so far. He says, he says that he wants to implement this model. It's still not clear. I mean, the, the model, the new First Amendment model um, that only the law is the limit, but it's still not clear because the community standards are still there. I mean, the community standards of Twitter I mean, as far as I know, they haven't been changed so far. Huh? So they are still there. Huh? Uh, but it seems that he's dismantling the, the, let's say, the content moderation teams, etc. 
it, it is not clear what is going on. But of course, if he wants to change things, he will have to change the community standards, he will have to, to, to change many things that remain there so far uh, as they are. The other thing uh, that, of course, it, is important is the fact that Twitter is subjected to the Digital Services Act. So there are things that cannot be dismantled hmm? because there are obligations uh, included in the Digital Services Act when it comes to risk mitigation, when it comes to, I mean, transparency, when it comes to information given to the user, etc., that Twitter will have to respect. Uh, and we'll see. I mean, now we see all these photo opportunities of Elon Musk, I mean, Elon Musk with, I mean, EU commissioners, etc. And but then at some point he may be facing. I mean, if he continues doing these kind of things, he may be fa facing serious penalties. Not only when it comes to to DSA obligations, but also when it comes to data protection obligations. Mm. No? So it, it's still quite uncertain because I mean the the, the Digital Services Act establishes that it is applicable to platforms that even if they are not based in Europe, um, platforms that, let's say, target an European audience. And this is the case of Twitter. Huh? The other thing is that, I mean, this is the Digital Services Act. If a, another country had established such a thing, we would be criticizing it. Saying, oh, you are violating the principle of country of origin. Uh, also, the Digital Services Act says that you need, I mean, companies need to have a representative in Europe. Huh? Other countries have been criticized for, for establishing that because, of course, there was the concern that these people could be arrested. No, of course, but, but still, I mean, the, 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 the provision is, is exactly the same. No? So, I mean, first thing, we, we need to see what really happens with Twitter because perhaps Elon Musk wants to radically change the, even the business model and he wants to use Twitter perhaps for something else, let's say another PayPal, so this is some, what pe some people say. And the other thing that we, of course, we, we need to expect to see is what, what will happen with, uh, with uh, let's say, when, when European authorities will start, I mean, applying the laws, the applicable new laws to Twitter, uh, and they find, of course, probably they will find certain violations. Um, I, I would also argue that uh, this whole idea that Twitter was uh, doing a really good job before Elon is also really absurd mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the, the, these platforms have structural problems uh, uh, the, 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 in their design when they started. And I think uh, uh, we, we tend to ignore this, the, 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 the way this whole conversation sort of takes place from Silicon Valley and then uh, um, sort of influence the entire world around tech and, you know, around these tech giants is also very problematic. Now everyone is talking about that Twitter is bad because Elon took, uh, took over. The problem is that Twitter was, if not that bad, Twitter was also not perfect for the global majority. But because the global majority was never part of the conversation, that what, how these platforms are responding to the users in those uh, jurisdictions is actually part of the problem. And now again, what we are seeing is the overnight, everyone is talking about that Elon is, has taken over. That's why the platform is bad. No, I think we should really start this conversation from the, uh, you know, from the, uh, uh, the, the structural point of view that why these platforms are bad in terms of their structure, in terms of their design, in terms of the, the, the products that they have introduced in the past, all of that, not just overnight. You know, I, I also find this whole thing really problematic where, you know, the Silicon Valley is taking over this entire, you know, uh, conversation and Can narrative. I ask you, and why are you in the board? Well, uh, I decided to be part of the board because uh, the way I'm criticizing these companies now, I have been criticizing the company for over a decade now. Uh, while sitting in uh, uh, the global south, I see how these companies have been responding to the marginalized groups and vulnerable users. And it has been tiring. And it, it, I was exhausted. And when this, the whole conversation around board was started, 
seeing how our governments are bringing these regulatory frameworks where we have no power as users, mm. and then seeing at least companies are bringing self-regulatory models where at least we will have powers to change the internal systems to some extent, or at least tell the companies that they are wrong here and they need to change it. Uh, and that's why I decided to be part of the board that at least our voices are there. I mean, I'm seeing all these white boards and it's not good for the global majority. Mm. I think that this morning, I mean, listening to, to Monica Bickert, we, we saw, because she was very honest and uh, a bit even candid, uh, saying, I mean, describing um, the issues that she has when it comes to content moderation. At some point, I think she was mentioning, in every morning I have my team, people from my team saying, oh, we took this down and we shouldn't have, uh, and now we need to take this down, but we didn't see it, etc." So it's like, it's like listening to the editorial board in a newspaper. E exactly. So, I mean, one would have assumed <laughs> that these things happen in a more rational manner or more, uh, but no, it's, I mean, it's her that uh, she has meetings with the team and all of a sudden someone says, oh, look, this is, uh, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Okay, what do we do now? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the way or she was. The decisions, or, or, or maybe the decisions of the board are keeping them up at night. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I think it was, it was very, I mean, I, I was surprised to, to, to see this exercise of, of, of honesty, say, describing this, because this is the impression that, that sometimes we have when it comes to important decisions taken by Facebook, for example. No, when, when for example, I um, mean, Donald Trump, the, Donald, uh, his account was, was suspended, etc. No, because it was up, and then all, all of a sudden it went down, and, and it, it seems that, I mean, they couldn't find Mark Zuckerberg, then finally they found him, and he said, oh, what do we do now? Okay, let's take it down, because, I mean, it was something I mean, it did, the, the, the sequence was not logical. I mean, it was like, I mean, there were, I mean, you could imagine people making phone calls, talking yeah. to each other, mm -hmm. and then say, what do we do now? Okay, yeah. let's do this and see, and see what happens. No? And I think that that is one of the problems here, that, that sometimes we have the impression that these companies are like some, okay, what do we do now? No? Yeah. I mean, and then, of course, this gives you a feeling of, I would say, okay, are we safe uh, in, the, in their hands? No? Because we might assume that the decisions are taken in a more rational basis, because yeah. I'm sure that if the president of Zambia or some, somewhere else had made the same statement, I mean, the, they would have applied to him the regular procedure. Right. I'm sure they wouldn't have woken up Mark Zuckerberg at his hotel and say, what do we do now, etc. No, I mean, by default, right. I mean, so, I mean, we have the impression that... That's good. Th th I'm not sure Mark Zuckerberg sleeps at all, so I think... <laughs> uh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, Karen? Yeah, yeah. One, one a very concrete problem about Twitter while we were, we were talking about country health uh, policy thing. Uh, I mean, even before states enacted their own regulations, Twitter made some negotiations with, with the governments. Uh, in uh, 2013, uh, sorry, in 2014, before the elections, Turkey totally banned Twitter in Turkey. And I was the applicant before the Constitutional Court, so proudly uh, responsible for the lifting of this uh, ban uh, that year. But following this event, because Turkey realized that they couldn't continue this ban forever, they invited the Twitter team to Turkey. As you stated, uh, there, there, there were negotiations behind the doors, and then Turkey started to use this country with health policy. So, I mean, if it is not forbidden in the United States or in Europe, that same content should be accessible in Turkey. What does it mean, country health? Uh, policy. This is unacceptable. A lot of uh, accounts used by uh, Turkish uh, uh, opposition uh, account holders living abroad are still not accessible in Turkey because of this uh, country uh, health policy. So I think uh, even before Elon Musk, yeah. Twitter has its own mm. serious problems, and uh, th those problems transfer to the, to the new uh, owner of the uh, company. I'm not expecting him to solve this okay. uh, anyway. But All right. Yeah. Here? Over here, please. 
Yeah, so uh, today Danish newspaper Berlinske reports that uh, the French satellite television distributor uh, Utelsat has been ordered by the French uh, television authority Arcom to quit uh, uh, showing to or distrib distributing uh, to Russian TV channels. Is this a clear cut case of a, a recession? in the freedom of speech and, and walking away from the competitive as advantage, as, as Jacob puts it? Or, or what, do you th what, do you, what is your take on this? And, and what do you think the implications are? There was a, a legal dispute in France because it was not clear whether the regulator had the power to, but that was, this is some sort of legal technicality, if you wish, whether it had to be the judge, etc. This is not the first time that this discussion takes place in, 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 in France, because more than 10 years ago, there was this, this Lebanese television channel that was received by a Utelsat in France, uh, Almanar, uh, that had, I mean, according to French legislation, had anti-Semitic content, and, and they tried to ban it, and there was a, a long legal process. So this is, I mean, this is not new, let, let, let's say. No? But uh, this case, of course, it is, it, it, it is very, very le relevant, because first of all, there's a, there's a treaty, I mean, and I, and I would need to, to locate it, but there's a, an international prohibition or a provision in international law when it comes to ja jamming TV signals. You cannot jam TV signals. Huh? Uh, and there's a treaty somewhere that says that this cannot be done. But this is something that is quite, quite forgotten, huh? because I think it, this applied to, to radio. But in addition to that, I mean, I think that, well, in this case, uh, when it comes to Russian television channels, this is in application of something that was decided by the European Council a few months ago. Uh, but in, in this case, I mean, I would also say that, I mean, I, 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 I don't believe this is the best way to deal with the, with this matter because I mean um, I think that the decision taken by the council is very deficient uh, in the sense that it doesn't contain a clear description of the type of content that uh, we want to try to avoid because in in countries based on the rule of law and the respect of fundamental rights when you adopt a decision against a television channel you need to have a regulatory judicial decision where you identify pieces of content. Yeah. And you need to describe, analyze pieces of content, and you check them against the law, and you say, OK, this is a legal violation, and this is why I'm imposing this penalty to you. Mm -hmm. If you read the decision of the European Council on banning uh, RT, etc., etc., it's just a paragraph saying, RT is disseminating propaganda, blah, 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 so we don't want it in Europe. Uh, this is why we ban it. Well, this kind of decision is the decision of an authoritarian regime. Because you do not properly describe mm. the kind of content. You are not saying why this content is illegal. And you are not saying why the decision that you are taking is proportionate to the harm that this content has created. I mean, and this is the way you need to proceed every time you impose a sanction of this nature. No? Mm. And this is not the case. No? So the, I mean, I, I, from the very beginning, I criticized this, this approach because this is, I mean, a decision that is the Europe taking this decision has decided in the Russian way. Yeah. instead of the European way. Yeah. I mean, has acted as an authoritarian regime yeah. without, I mean, the safeguards. I know that then the court dismissed, I mean, there was, I mean, so, someone tried to go before the court, it didn't work, etc. But I still, I'm, I'm very critical when it comes to, to this decision, yeah. honestly. Yeah. An interesting precedent is about Denmark. There was a Roche TV versus Denmark case decided by the European Court of Human Rights. And, uh, I, I was trying to find the name, and I uh, f fall into the uh, f your website, by the way. Um, and the, the, the European Court very rarely uh, implements Article 17 in freedom of expression cases. And in Roche TV versus Denmark, it uh, used Article 17 to reject the application of the television. But in that case, there was a direct link between uh, the terrorist organization and uh, the television company. So uh, the, the, there, there should be a link between the content 
and the requirement of uh, uh, prohibition. When th th this doesn't exist, uh, any excuse to ban a television uh, station is unacceptable and against the European Convention, International Covenant, all international human rights standards. So uh, I agree with you on this. Yeah. All right. I guess the 